Uh, I'm going to talk, as uh, Daniel said, about some experience from some work in two countries. I'm going to take about 20, 25 minutes, and then Ross is going to uh, clear up the mess after I've made it and come and, come and talk and sort out the issues. <laughs> and then after that, we'll have time for some discussions, okay? So, um, you've read the title by now. There are some handouts, there's some spare ones here. If anybody hasn't got one and would like one, I'll leave them, leave them there, help yourselves. And these, those are just copies of the slides that I'm, that I'm going to take us through. Okay, so the focus is very much on smallholder farmers, and it's on how to facilitate their decision-making and planning processes, how to provide them information that they can use in a way that's useful and usable by them. And the three things that we've incorporated into this, first of all, the use of analysed historical data. So many countries have met stations with data recorded from... Um, 50, 60, 70 years of daily records. And often that is sitting there as a great resource that can be used to look at to what's happening to the climate. Secondly, the use of forecasts, so short-term and long-term forecasts. And the third element is bringing in some participatory planning uh, tools to use with farmers to help them explore what this, could help, what this could mean for them in terms of their farming. So turning this into a practical um, decision-making process. Uh, the work has really been at a pilot stage so far. So in Zimbabwe, we've been running for one season in three pilot provinces in the country, and that's funded by Nuffield Foundation. And then in Tanzania, we've been working with, uh, in one district with around 30 staff. But we're hoping this next year to scale it up considerably, uh, not just in these countries, but elsewhere. Okay, this is the basic cycle that we've been using. So uh, I'm going to be coming back to this slide several times, but... If I just take you through the slide and the process, before the season, analysis of the historical data, um, also the training of the extension and NGO staff who are going to work directly with the farmers. Then they go and work with uh, the farmers before the season still, doing some participatory exercises and using the information and training. Then the farmers obviously go into their season, they start uh, their farming, making their decisions, etc., and they keep being supplied by information during the season. So now this is the short-term forecast, the five-day forecasts. Uh, this uh, ideally provided directly to them by SMS, but this, this, this hasn't happened um, to scale yet. This is what we would have liked to have done. It didn't actually happen to scale. Um, and then after the season, reviewing, learning from it, improving uh, the, the, the process. Okay, so if we just take the first box before the season and let's look at the analysed historical data and what that can tell us. So a colleague of mine at Reading, Roger Stern, has been working uh, all over the world, uh, but particularly in Africa, on enabling and training people in analysis of historical data. And as I said, there is a lot of data there sitting there, much of it unanalysed. So here is a, a typical graph that we can produce for Dodoma in Tanzania. And it shows us the total rainfall uh, every year since 1935 to 2010. If you look at that, can anybody see any, any patterns or trends? OK, don't take a look too hard because I can't see any. <laughs> and statistically, there isn't, OK? It's, it's a variable climate. It, it's, there's variation going on. Yep. And what we found is actually... For all the stations, well, the vast majority of stations we've looked at across Zimbabwe, uh, Tanzania, uh, many places in Kenya, and in areas of West Africa, this is typical. We're actually not seeing the uh, trends or changes that people are talking about. Okay, before you start thinking, has Daniel invited a climate denier, into <laughs> climate change denier, <laughs> into our midst? He hasn't, okay? The data very clearly shows that temperature is rising. Okay, the temperature in many of these places, you can see a straight line, and I'll show you one in a minute. But if we look at aspects of rainfall, it doesn't actually show for many places that the, change, the change is occurring that many people are talking about. Okay, a bit controversial, I know. So here we are. This is for um, an area in Zimbabwe, and this is another, another way that we can analyse the data. So this now tells us the season length, again looking from around 1960 up to 2010, and um, on, the, on the vertical axis, you have the, um, the length in days, 
and this is the variation in the season length. Again, very variable, but no discernible pattern. They're not getting shorter, they're not getting longer. There's not more variation as you get towards the end of the graph. It's just very variable. I'm now going to pick a site in West Africa where we have all the, all the analyzed data in a standard format, and I'm just going to take you through these very quickly. And these are a standard set of graphs that we would produce for a MET station to then use with farmers. And I'm coming to the use with farmers in a minute because that's the key bit of it. So here we are, total rainfall, um, no discernible patterns, um, number of rain days in the year, because it may be about rainfall intensity that's changed. It's not just totals. But if you look at that, no. First occasion from uh, beginning of May with more than 20 millimetres within three days. So that's now telling us about the, first, the beginning of the rains, which is obviously a very important thing for farmers. When should I plant? When have the rains started that I, sufficiently that I can now plant? And again, a lot of variation. Um, we can now add in a condition there of dry spells, so these green dots. Uh, this, the blue is the same graph as before. The green dots are now showing us um, when we don't get uh, 10 or more days of drought or dry spell within 21 days of that first planting opportunity. So these, if you like, are the proper start of the planting season because if you'd planted here, your crop would have failed because you would have had a dry spell immediately afterwards. So you can then add, add in these conditions. These are the longest dry spells within the growing season. These are the season lengths. So here is the end of the season, here's the beginning of the season, and the difference between is the length. So we can see lots of change, no pattern. What's the quality of the measurement in your expert opinion? In terms of the data that this has come from? Reliability, relevant? Uh, uh, good. Um, and this is all from daily data. So this is all from data that is taken on a daily basis. And, then, and so as part of the process of analysing it, obviously you look at the quality. And it's not a trivial thing to do, is that you have to look at the data, see what the quality is, see where there are errors, where there's missing data, decide whether it's usable or not. So all that has happened beforehand to get to a stage where you're happy with this data to then analyse it and, and do the analysis. So anything that's shown is we're happy with, with the quality. It does vary, but yes, sure. These graphs are all from the same place and the same weather station. Okay? If there's a difference in dates, it may be because, they, because that data wasn't available or they weren't recording at, at that period of time. Yeah. So this is a typical set that one would produce for one weather station. Yeah. This is the range of products, if you like, which you can then use in that first step and anal analyse um, historical data with farmers. And then here's the temperature. So this is maximum temperature. These are minimum temperatures. And you can see here the minimum temperature picking up after around 1960 and showing uh, an increase. And this is a, a statistically significant um, change there. And that's, that's very typical for many different sites. Now, there are sites where rainfall is changing. They tend to be perhaps the wetter areas. Uh, and there are some in uh, Kenya and Uganda that I'm aware of. But nothing like the extent to which um, we're all talking about. In, you know, as academics, as farmers and NGOs, we're talking about a lot more change. So these are the products, if you like, temperature, rainfall, season start. I won't go through these again. These are the graphs I've shown you. And trying to produce these in very clear graphs and tables for farmers and extension workers to use, and also to develop tools that make the interpretation of this quite easy. So how do we use them with farmers? Well, what we found is that when you introduce these graphs to farmers and explain what they are, um, they very quickly pick up on, on what they mean and their interpretation. And in Zimbabwe, this is farmers that are, are non-literate or semi-literate. Um, doesn't matter if people can, can, can read or write. People are numerate, as I'm sure you all, you're all very familiar with from your experience. And so people get the graphs really quite quickly. And that then leads on to a discussion around comparison with their experience. You know, which were good years, which were bad years, what happened. And also consider the causes of, of problems that they have. Because very often people will be saying, yes, the climate's changing, it's changing in this way, it's changing in that way. And that leads on to a discussion to say, well, 
that's interesting. Why, why is it, why do, what's your evidence for it changing? Not challenging it, but what's the basis for your saying it's changing? And if you don't have rainfall data, then the basis of your saying it's changing is based on your experience of other things. It's based on perhaps crop yield. It's based on um, whether yields were good or bad in a particular year. It's based maybe on um, water tables, whether you can still irrigate or not in the dry season. It's based on a whole range of things, and it's based on what other people say as well. And if you unpack that and think, talk about the causes, we may, well, we often do come to the conclusion that climate is one aspect that's affecting things. But reduced water tables, more variable yields or declining yields may be a product of something else. Declining soil fertility, less fertilizer available, all sorts of other things. And so sometimes we get a multiplication of factors all mixed up together and climate is, is blamed for it. Now, that's actually very important because if you're a farmer or you're an NGO and we think that the climate is the source of all our problems, there's, very limited, there's a very limited amount that a farmer can do. The climate is the climate. You can't change the climate. But if it's soil or if it's overgrazing or if it's farming on more marginal land, those are things that, that we can do something about. So this is not in any way a downplaying climate. It's just saying, are there other causes of what we're seeing? And let's look at everything together. Secondly, um, we found that it provides a baseline of information that farmers didn't have before. And it then leads into discussions on practical farming. So without us introducing things about crop varieties, for example, farmers then start talking about crop varieties. So having looked at the rainfall, having looked at the season length, those conversations begin to happen. And then the third thing we can do with this historical data is talk about probabilities. So if the climate has, been, has not been changing statistically, then we can say the next season we can, we can express that in a probability of what might happen based on what's happened in the past. So you can say, based on what's happened here, there is a one in three chance that next season you will have more than this amount of rain or you will have less than this amount of rain. And farmers, we found, are actually quite comfortable with probability if it's uh, explained in a, and explored in a very simple way. So here we are going back to the Dodoma graph. Um, if you said that, okay, for, and this is just an example, it may not be accurate, uh, that in this area you need more than 700 millimetres of rainfall to grow maize, you can very simply take a, a line across here, cover this up with a piece of paper or put a ruler across, and say, okay, how many years uh, have we had more than 700 millimetres of rainfall? And people can simply count across, and then you say, okay, let's divide that by the number of years, and let's turn that into a rough probability. And you can do that. And that means something. Next year, the chance of getting more than 700 millimetres is, let's say, for example, 1 in 10. So is maize the best thing I should be doing? Discussion can, can in, you know, ensue from that. So working out probabilities is not actually a very complicated thing. People play games. It's all about probability. So again, you can be non-literate, but you can be numerate. And probability is not beyond that at all. So having analysed the historical data, the next thing we've done is to train extension staff. So typically around, three, around 30 staff together for four or five days, uh, bringing people together, um, doing a lot of participatory work, looking at, um, OK, the analysed data, how can it be used, where is it from, what uses it to farmers. Then looking at the other things, the forecasts, where do they come from, how accurate are they, what are their uses. And then thirdly, this third element of participatory approaches, what are they, uh, introduction to those. And very importantly, you spend a day trying these things out with farmers in a local community. And without this, um, I don't think it would be nearly as successful. This really opens people's eyes. Before you get to here, people th the, you can tell that the trainees are thinking, yeah, this is all very well in theory, but I'm not convinced. But then when you do it in the field, people come back really enthusiastic and, and believe it can be done. And then normally a final day to plan activities. So that's the typical sequence we've gone through in the training. Extension workers then go back to their areas they're working with, and they would normally be working with existing groups of farmers, 
and they will then go through a set of activities with those farmers before the season starts. Okay, so they would use the historical climate data just like we've already discussed and explored. But at this stage now, we're getting closer to the start of the season and they can now bring in the seasonal climate forecast. So I don't know how many of you, from, how, how many people have come across seasonal climate forecast? One or two. Okay, so these are forecasts produced for different regions of the world and different countries which make a very crude estimate, a prediction of the climate for the next year. They talk largely for, for sub-Saharan Africa anyway about the probability of the rainfall being uh, above or below normal. Very crude, but they give some kind of indication. So we introduce these at, at following on from these activities looking at the past. And then we go into using some participatory planning methods to talk about what does this mean for farming and for livelihoods. So it's wider than farming, it's about livelihoods. And we can do this for the seasonal climate forecast, but we can also do this to explore a good year, a medium year, um, and perhaps a bad year. So let me show you an example. So it's not quite as big a mess as it looks, but mm -hmm. with a group of farmers, and we tend to work with farmers that are similar to each other for this to work well. So you might be working with a group of farmers that are um, perhaps better off than average, or a group of farmers that are worse off than average. So farmers that are similar to each other. And this diagram then represents all their livelihood activities. And so here we have a family of, of five, no, six, and these are the different activities they do, their livelihood activities. So they grow maize, they grow maize on two fields. Uh, these are chickens, believe it or not, and these are being sold uh, for cash. They taste very nice, they just don't look very good. Um, they keep some other livestock. Um, they have somebody working in town sewing and bringing money back, and they have somebody uh, doing an office job and bringing money back. So this is quite a wealthy, wealthy household, and they produce vegetables for sale. So then we can say, okay, that was for last year, or a typical year. What would you do if you knew ahead of time that it was likely to be a good year? And then, you'd, without introducing any ideas, just get farmers discussing. And they'll come up with ideas and start sharing ideas with each other. What would you do if you knew it was actually going to be a worse year than normal? And people now start sharing ideas. And typically on this, people would say, okay, I wouldn't apply fertilizer. I would ease back and maybe stop my broiler production because I know there's not going to be a market for it. I would make sure that these activities are going really well because we need to rely on them. So all these practical things start coming out. And in Zimbabwe, we've got evidence of people actually changing some of their activities as a result of this. So obviously, our role is not to change people's minds or change what they're doing. It is simply to present them with information in a way that they can interpret for themselves. Okay, here's a participatory uh, enterprise budget, and this is now doing a similar thing, but focusing on an individual enterprise. So we could say for maybe the maize production or the broiler production, let's now look in more detail what you would do for that. Now, the participatory enterprise budget you can use in this context of looking at climate, but you can use it, use it for all sorts of other purposes. It's quite, to me, it's quite an exciting um, participatory approach. So here we have time along the top, November, December, January, February, March, April. This is not showing the actual, an actual budget, it's more just diagrammatically showing how it works. The top line is activities. So here we have um, a lady uh, preparing her fields, planting, applying fertilizer and weeding, weeding, bird scaring and harvesting. So these are activities that she or a group of people have identified that they do normally on their, on their management of their maize plot. Now the next line we have the inputs and out, the inputs related to each of those activities. So 10 person days or whatever uh, unit people are comfortable with and, and say there and come up with. Five bags um, of fertilizer, no five bags of seed, uh, labor, 10 bags of nitrogen, etc. So you quantify all of the inputs that go with each activity. And then you have the outputs at the end. So you could do this for last year or a typical year. 
And this then provides the basis of exploring different scenarios. It's a little bit like a spreadsheet, an Excel spreadsheet, except it's not, not as fast, but it does the same thing. So you're then saying, what would happen if we change something? What would happen if we planted later? What would happen if we switched to organic? What would happen if we knew it was going to be a good year? What would happen if we knew it was going to be a bad year? And you get all this discussion going on, and you kind of model it with people, and they come up with what would happen. So it provides a very nice tool for exploring scenarios, and you can use this in you know, for businesses. You can use, it doesn't have to be for agriculture. You can use it for sewing or all sorts of things. So here we are, and I should have said, you can, when you do that, you often do it with counters or beans. You can do it on the ground. It doesn't have to be on a flip chart. Um, so we've introduced three things. We've introduced the historical data, the forecasts, and the tools to explore the, the options. During the season, then ideally, farmers get an update of the five-day forecast. So these are the short-term forecasts. And these are particularly valuable around the start of the season when people are thinking, should I plant or not, as the season started. And then people continue getting that through the, through the season. And then at the end, we bring people together and we say, OK, how did it work? Um, what was useful, what worked well, what didn't? And we do the same with extension. OK, so I'm going I'm to round up now by, saying, by just reflecting on what we've learned. And then on the next slide, I think, just saying, OK, what's next and, and what should we do next? So first of all, farmers had no, no previous basic information on their climate. It's common sense. We know that. But actually, if you think that everything you have is based on uh, perception of what's around you, actually having the figures in front of you is actually a useful starting point, And people found that. We discussed perceptions, we discussed causes of problems and solutions, and that was very useful because it took us away from climate as well to talk about other causes and other problems and other solutions. It led on to people talking about management decisions, both for the cro at the crop level, but also around uh, livelihoods as well. Something we weren't expecting but came out was that farmers reported that they started um, implementing innovations that they were already aware of but were not doing. So in one of the areas of Zimbabwe, uh, conservation agriculture is promoted quite heavily by NGOs and extension. And some of the farmers reported that having been engaged with this process of looking at climate information, they began to see the importance of the conservation agriculture and therefore got engaged with the CA process. Um, and the participatory tools are work, um, worked well in terms of planning ahead, and we, we've seen evidence of people at a livelihood level changing their activities uh, as a result of doing these, using these participatory tools. Now, there are things that we need to develop and improve. I think livestock is an area that we haven't focused on. Livestock's extremely important, and I think that's one of the things to, to explore next. Um, I'm going to skip that slide for time, and I'm going to just introduce one other, a couple of questions, and then sum up. I've talked very much about um, farmers, NGOs, extension at that level. But I think there's also a wider question, and this is something we've been exploring in, a, in, in some other work, and that's to what extent is climate and weather information being used both in policy and in practical project design? And I'm just going to give you two, two quick examples that I've come across. One from East Africa, which was an NGO we were working with recently. Uh, we took them through this process. They actually analysed the data themselves, which was fantastic. And then we looked backwards at some of the projects they'd had. And we said, what would you have done differently if you were designing the same project now that you've got this information? And here, here's an example. They were working with farmers, identifying innovations that farmers had come up with. So they were promoting farmer innovation, identifying innovations, and then um, working with research uh, to explore those innovations and then to help disseminate them. So they went through a phase of identifying innovations, and then they screened out and rejected all the innovations that didn't address declining rainfall. OK, just took them out because that's what everybody says, rainfall's declining. 
the graphs show that the rainfall is not declining. So there's a kind of clear message there. Crop breeding, another one was, um, and this is now looking at modelling, where we can look ahead at what's happening, what's likely to happen. And a lot of people are focusing on shorter, short, shorter season duration crops. So developing crops that, are, that mature more quickly because they're less risky. Yeah, and that makes a lot of sense for now. And this was a recommendation that was actually put out internationally by a very credible body, said that in order to address climate change, breeders should be focusing on short season duration varieties. That's the direction. If you put it into a model, into a crop model, and you raise the temperatures, because the temperatures are higher, the crop grows quicker, and it doesn't actually have the time to fill the grain. This was for maize. So short season dura duration varieties are actually not what's needed further on. So these are examples of where we need to look at the information we've got in order to, to plan our activities and think clearly what we want to achieve. So final slide, final thoughts. How do we scale up and make sustainable the sorts of ideas I've been discussing? Um, we need to be careful we don't treat climate as the only driver. It's very, very important, but it's not the only one. What other information and support should farmers get alongside climate information? It's no good if they identify we need new varieties if they then can't get those varieties. And I know you're working in the kind of business area. There's, I'm sure there's equivalent issues in there. And finally, are organisations, NGOs, research, government, using the available information that we have before they plan, before they uh, develop proposals and direction? And what are the, what, you know, how could this improve effectiveness of what we do? But also, we have to look at the other side. What are the dangers if we don't? Okay, that's all I had to say. I've probably slightly over.